the Easter Bunny, and the dyeing of Easter eggs are also symbols of fertility connected to Ishtar, biblically referenced as the Queen of Heaven. Long before the birth of our Messiah, December 25th was a day used to celebrate the rebirth of the Sun God. All of this and more has all been justified by man for hundreds of years. But when was the last time we considered what our Creator had to say regarding all of this? Do we care? Should we care? We reveal an opportunity and faith-centered challenge to worship and practice the faith as He stated He desires for all His people, not according to us, not according to men, but instead according to His way, according to His Word. That is, if you are ready to test everything. And now we come to the fourth month. You notice the name of the fourth month. Can anyone pronounce that for me? Tammuz. Tammuz. Right on the biblical Hebrew calendar, we have the month of Tammuz. That's what it is on the Jewish calendar. Does anyone know anything about Tammuz? We read about Tammuz in Ezekiel 8. It talks about the we widows, or excuse me, the women weeping for Tammuz. Now, what is this women weeping for Tammuz? What do we have going on here? We have to just step back a little bit and find out who Tammuz's mother was. Because uh, his mother was married to Nimrod. Nimrod, the builder of the Tower of uh, Babel, uh, that's his fame, he died and he ascended up into heaven and became the sun or the sun god. Now, many, many months later, after his death and then ascension and he became the sun god, then his uh, widow, Semiramis, became pregnant. And the story was she became pregnant by the rays of the sun, her husband who ascended into heaven. So it is that we have the month of Tammuz. Now, what happened is Semiramis died. But, as luck would have it, she was reincarnated on the first Sunday after the vernal equinox as Easter, the goddess of fertility, who came down out of heaven in this giant egg, landing in the Euphrates River, busting out and turning a bird into an egg-laying rabbit. <laughs> then, Tammuz died, as luck would have it. I you do use the word facetiously, because he died by being gored by a wild boar in his 40th year. And so, from then on, after his death, he was worshipped by setting aside one day of weeping for Tammuz for each year of his life. So, the 40 days preceding the day when his mother was reborn as Easter, the goddess of fertility, that set aside the 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. Now I think it's called Lent. And then, on Easter Sunday, then they kill the wild boar that killed Tammuz and eat ham on Easter Sunday. This is the sick sun god perversion that Israel got into, and God says it's an abomination. It's utterly re detestable, repugnant, and putrid. The word abomination, one of the strongest words in the entire Hebrew language. And of course, we see that same thing has been adopted by the Christian Gentile church, and they think it's in worship of the true God. It is not. It is utterly detestable to the true God, and he said, do not. Do not learn the way of the heathen. Do not learn how they serve their gods. Do it and say you're doing it for me. It's an abomination. So those who would say, well, it doesn't mean that to me. Well, it really doesn't matter what it means to you. We don't worship you. We worship the true God. <laughs> and if he says it's an abomination, then it's and what? Abomination. Just pure and simple. Did you know that Easter as a celebration has nothing to do with Jesus Christ? The name itself does not mean resurrection of Christ like you may believe. The word Easter actually comes from the name of an anciently worshipped fertility goddess. You can also go online and quickly learn the origins of Easter bunnies, colored eggs, hot cross buns, and the sunrise service. You'll find these modern parts of the Easter celebration come from ancient, ungodly, pre-Christian religions. They were around a long time before the time of Christ and they have nothing to do with the Bible record or the church. So now let's travel back in time 4,000 years and begin to discover where the history of some of these traditions came from. We're going to find ourselves all the way back in the time of Noah. 
Matter of fact, let's begin in the old-fashioned way. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there lived a man named Nimrod. Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah. He was the most popular man on the earth at the time. Matter of fact, he was the king of the then known world. He was responsible for building the cities of, of Babel and all, the Tower of Babel and the city of Nineveh amongst others. Well, all that being aside, Nimrod no doubt had tremendous influence among the people that he was with. And what happened was uh, he had this uh, uncanny uh, reputation of strength. Uh, he created great uh, armies and uh, he, he was the ruler of the then known world right after the flood. He was full of idolatry and covetousness, drunkenness, and uh, rebelliousness, rebelliousness towards God. And he had a phenomenal ability to deceive. Matter of fact, I suppose he was much like, a, I guess, an early politician 4,000 years ago. But Nimrod married a woman named Semiramis. Now, Semiramis and, and Nimrod would became basically king and queen of the then known world. Well, at some point, Nimrod dies and he became deified. He was the very first person that was ever deified on planet Earth, and they made him the sun god, which ended up being Baal. The word Baal in your scriptures can be traced back to Nimrod, so it's an interesting uh, reality of history when you see Baal and Ashtaroth, you're ending up coming all the way back to this story of Nimrod and Semiramis. And so Baal is now ruling the universe as the sun god, and somehow, luck has it, through the Babylonian legend, that Semiramis gets pregnant by the rays of the son of her deceased husband, Nimrod. And she gives birth to a young baby boy named Tammuz. Now, further down in the story, as Tammuz grows and becomes a man, Tammuz actually marries his mother and they have a very uh, sexual relationship. And that baby Tammuz and his mother Semiramis is where you get the story of Cupid. Cupid, it, during Valentine's Day, is how the story of Valentine's Day developed was from uh, Tammuz, who married a, a very uh, unbiblical relationship uh, with his mother. Okay, back to the story of Tammuz. So Tammuz, for 40 years, was a tremendous hunter, and he took the place of his father, ruling the world, and had tremendous power, but more than anything, he was a credible hunter. But unfortunately, his gift and his skill of hunting caught up with him one day because he was killed during his 40th year by a wild boar. And so what would happen is Semiramis, at some point after that, she died and she was sent up into heaven, but apparently her deceased husband, Baal, was not ready for her. So he sent her back down into the, uh, into, into earth in a giant egg and it exploded in the Euphrates River and the very first thing that she did when she came out of that egg was she turned a bird into an egg laying rabbit. That's right, as crazy as it sounds, that's where we get our egg laying rabbit from. That's where we get the Easter Bunny from. Now, before you go any further, you're thinking, well, an egg, she, this sounds like a fairy tale. Well. It's a Babylonian legend, but you have to understand Eastern culture back then is that eggs were a tremendous symbol of fertility among many of the gods. They even believed that the earth was born out of a giant egg. So it's not surprising amongst the scholars that this legend would be that Semiramis would come back down in the form of an egg that would immediately uh, tell the people of the earth that this is a god. It's in a goddess situation. It's a deity because there is an egg of fertility that's involved. And so what happens is we're gonna, you're going to see similarities now between the holiday of Easter and the traditions that we celebrate during Easter and all of these traditions that date back two, three, and 4,000 years ago. So right off the bat, we, we discover that the Easter Bunny comes from that one act uh, that Semiramis did when she broke out of the egg. Let's see if we can find some other traditions as we move along here. Now, every spring, uh, the first Sunday after the vernal equinox, the spring equinox, they have what was called Ishtar's, uh, Ishtar's Sunday. And they would have a sunrise service. Now, this part of the legend uh, is difficult to confirm because there's so many different versions. You can make up your own mind uh, whether or not uh, this particular part of the legend will, will be accredited to you. 
Uh, but it is quite interesting how one particular part uh, of the legend lines up so eerily with dying of Easter eggs. Because what they used to do in this part of the legend was that at the sunrise service, the priest of Ishtar uh, would impregnate young virgins on the altar. And during that same service, they would take the babies that were now three month old from the previous year and they would sacrifice those children on the altar to Ishtar, and then they would take the eggs of Ishtar, and they would dip those eggs in the blood of those young infants. And that is where we get sunrise services, and uh, that is potentially where we get the dying of Easter eggs. It is also interesting to note that worldwide, universal color of Easter eggs is red. Even the White House the official color of the White House Easter egg is ruby red. Now, back to Tammuz. Tammuz gets killed by a wild boar. So every year in commemoration of celebrating the death and the deification of Tammuz, which became the son of God, the son of his father, they would set aside 40 days prior to Easter in, and they would fast and they would pray and they would have a giant feast on Easter Sunday where they would celebrate the, the death and the resurrection of Tammuz. And guess what they would have for dinner on that Sunday evening? You got it, Easter ham. They would kill a boar in commemoration to Tammuz who was killed by a wild boar. And yes, the 40 days prior to Easter, uh, we call it Lent, or the Catholics call it Lent. That 40 days did not come from, my friends, the 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness. That 40 days was already in place for thousands of years before Jesus even showed up. It comes from the 40 days of fasting and praying for Tammuz before they celebrated Easter. The 40 days of, of the fasting and praying of Jesus, and I like to call him by his Hebrew name, uh, Yeshua, which means salvation, uh, Yeshua's uh, fasting and praying in the wilderness for 40 days is just a coincidence. Why? Because the Father knows the truth and the enemy used to be the right-hand man of the Father. And he knows the prophecies. He knew exactly how everything was going to be laid out. So he developed all of these traditions of men and all of these legends, uh, whether they be true or not true, but he developed them to skew our foresight and our ability to understand that when the truth would actually come, that we would not recognize it. He created a fraud, and we've, we've, we've swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. And so we begin to see some of these traditions. We discovered where Lent came from. We've discovered where Easter ham came from. We've discovered where the sunrise service came from. We've even discovered why we chose the first Sunday after the spring equinox. We didn't choose it. It's always been there on the celebration of Easter. Now, what's interesting about Easter and Baal, or Semiramis and Baal, is the names. We find these names all over Egyptian hieroglyphics, uh, all these different, uh, the Phoenician hieroglyphics, all these different artifacts from all over the world. And so I'm going to give you some of the names and, and what they're most commonly uh, remembered for in these different cultures, and some of you will recognize them immediately. First of all, in Egypt, they were known as Isis and Osiris. In Phoenicia, they were recognized as Asheroth and Baal, the very same Asheroth and Baal that you see in the scriptures. In Greece, they were Aphrodite and Adonis, or Eros, where we get the word erotic from. And in Rome, they were called Venus and Cupid. That's right, that's where we get Valentine's Day from and Cupid. Even in the Far East, listen to this, this is amazing, Cupid was known as Zoroaster. Zoroaster is made up of two words, Zoro, which means seed of, and Asheroth, which is Easter. And so what Cupid actually means in the Far East is the seed of Easter, or the seed of his mother. Okay, and that's from the archives, the bookshelf, February 1994, volume two, number two. We discovered Easter, Easter eggs, Easter ham, Lent, Cupid and Valentine's Day, where Easter Sunday is, and the sunrise services, and the like. Now we want to move into the scriptures and show you some connections of these names because you've read some of these scriptures and it is uncanny how 
Yahweh, God, always tries to speak to the Israelites and warn them to stay away from Ashtaroth and Baal. Let's read the Scriptures. Judges chapter 2, verse 13 says this, And they forsook Yahweh and served Baal and Ashtaroth. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 4 says, Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served Yahweh only. And last but not least, in Romans chapter 11, verse 4, it says, But what says the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now, what's really interesting is we are going to discover what that image of Baal is a little bit later in this program. Right about this time, you're probably having that thought that I warned you about hit your brain, saying, that's not what it means to me. I celebrate the birth of Jesus, and I put all the focus on Jesus, and I celebrate His resurrection, His resurrection, and I want to focus on Him. Well, your heart may be to want to focus on Him, and you absolutely may do that. But the truth of the matter is, is that it doesn't matter how much we focus, how sincere we are, and how pure our hearts are. It only matters, that are we worshiping Him the way that He asks us to worship Him? And is anything that we're doing offending Him. Now, later on in the program, we're going to go through the Scriptures and see if there are any Scriptures talking about Christmas and Easter and any particular instructions allowing us to worship Him in whatever way that we want. But in the meantime, Nimrod Ishtar, Ishtar. Sarte, the Queen of Heaven, och hon har många andra namn. In Wicca, they know her by many different names. Över hela jorden de känner till henne med olika namn. I varje hednisk religion så finns det en gudinna. Och alla dessa gudinnor kommer från en och samma lögn. When you really open your eyes, you start noticing and witnessing goddess worship all around you. And with goddess worship, we have sun goddess worship. Where there are sun worshippers, they worship the sun dyrkan också, och de dyrkar bal. And what do you do as a believer when you question? Vad gör man med den troende när man ifrågasätter det här ämnet? Vad gör du som en troende när församlingen håller på med dessa saker och blandar alltså kulturen med Jesu död på korset med, med påsken? För vi kommer att tala om Jesu uppståndelse, död uppståndelse igen. Vi kommer att tala om betydelsen av hans uppståndelse. Vi ska prata om tabernaklet. Men jag vill också beröra den begynnelsen av den här kulturen och den här religionen som är i kyrkan. För kyrkan förlorar slaget, kampen. Orsaken till att kyrkan förlorar slaget genom att man tillåter så många olika läror komma in i kyrkan. Framgångs predikan, trospredikan, det är så många olika läror som tar den här läran till en extrem. Varför händer alla dessa saker? Varför är kyrkan i en sån här ställning just nu. För Gud säger ju att vi ska inte dyrka honom som hedningarna gör. Why is it that all of these things have happened? Why is it that the church is at the status that is in? God tells us not to worship him as the heathens do. In 1 Samuel 12:10 we see two names. Första Samuel which if you search throughout history You will notice that they all söker have their origins kristna så ser du att det finns en begynnelse där i första mosboken kapitel 10 med Nimrod och hans familj. Och de ropade till Herren och sa vi har syndat för att vi har försakat vår Herre. Hur ofta är inte detta vårt vän? Första Samuel 12, 10. Att vi ber denna bön. Herre om du ger mig det här så kommer jag att tjäna dig. Gud har gett 
institutioner till How often is that not our prayers? I've heard people, God, if you give me this, I'll serve you. God has given the church instructions. In Kings 11:33 because 11, that they have forsaken ske, and have worshipped me and Astarte, the goddess of the Sidonians, Gudinna, Chemosh, Moabskud, or Milcom, Ammonitenas Gud. They have not gone to my way and not done what I have done in my eyes after my stadgar and prescriptions. Så som Salomos fader David gjorde. Vi talar om Gudinna tillbedjan. Och tror att det här är alldeles en ny sak? Nej, det finns ju i skriften. Det finns i skriften. Det finns i skriften. Det finns i skriften. I was asked the question, Tally, why is it that you're not so big into the Easter Bunny? Why is it that you're not so excited about it? You're not pumped about the Easter Bunny, man. Jeremia 10, vers 2. And so since it was Herren, after work and ni ska inte ta no efter, efter eget när folken sätt said, I just don't feel så att ni skräms av tecknen på himlen. Därför att hedna folken blir skrämda av den. Vi ska realize tänka på var det här kommer ifrån. Gudina tillbedjan och det är ingenting som Bibeln lär oss tvärtom varnar oss fram det är ingenting i Bibeln som säger att du ska lova är Jesus Kristus med en påsk kanin eller ett, ett påskägg. Men Gud har förbjudit oss att dyrka tillbedjans drottning. And they God forbade them from worshiping the Queen of Heaven. Yet they still did. In Genesis 10 and 11, we see what happened with Nimrod. In Genesis 10, verse 13, Nimrod disobeyed God. Nimrod led men into a rebellion against God. Motsat sig Gud. Och när Nimrod dog så var han hans kroppsdur i 14, 14 bitar. Och då var hans fru att de skulle leta efter de här delarna till kroppen. Och de fann alla utom en. Och det var mannens reproduktiva organ som de inte hittade. Så so därför så gjorde de den här obelesken som skulle påminna om detta organet i Nimrods namn. Och vi finner de, finner de här obeleskena över hela världen och till och med i Washington D.C. Och dessutom framför många kyrkbyggnader finns den här speciella polen också obelesken. Och den representerar Nimrod och Baal, mannens reproduktiva organ. SDA-grundaren James White obelisk på hans grav. Och varför associerar kyrkan och församlingen sig själv med Ishtar? Vad är det som församlingen tjänar på det? Att associera sig själv med Ishtar. Vem är Nimrod? Vad är det som kyrkan tjänar på att följa den här kulten och gudina dyrkan? Men de säger att Nimrod han gick upp till solen och han blev solen och solgud. Och där kommer soldyrkan ifrån. Men när han gick bort så så so after Nimrod is cut up into 14 pieces, moon, they Gudinnan. make an obelisk in remembrance of his male reproductive But they say that Nimrod och, rose up to the sun, eh, and now when they looked at the sun, that eh, was Nimrod. That was bow worship, sun worship. Och, the crazy de part about this is, and this is, I'm och, till making this henne. as condensed as possible, but I have a wide text. variety of videos that go in depth. Alla but basically, when he passes away, she claims to be a moon goddess, okay? They start doing rituals in the name of Ishtar, 
They start doing rituals in the name of the queen of heaven. They start doing rituals in her name because she claimed to be so many different things and people gobbled it up. Eventually what happened, one of the traditions in her name had to do with Easter bunny and eggs. So as we all... And they would do våra sacrifices våra to the queen of the heaven. One of the sacrifices fäder. involved virgins, gator. Då hade vi tillräckligt med and dipping eggs och då gick in det bra för oss. Like och I said, I'm going really fast because I want to make sure olika. we can get all of this in alltså the video Jeremiah timeline. Now, 17. Men, what does the church gain from associating itself with a tradition that stems from Nimrod and his wife. You have to understand that Wicca, witchcraft, Satanism, Church of Satan, all of these churches, they know. So varför då beblandar vi oss med allt detta? Vad är det som församlingen tjänar på det? They know that it's pagan. Matteus 22, 29. Jesus svarade dem, ni tar fel och förstår varken skriften eller Guds makt. But God called you a peculiar people. God called you to be separated. God has instructed his church to come out from among her because he has bought you with a price. And I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to attack you. But before you go out hunting for Easter bunny eggs, just remember, there has never been a bunny on the history of this world that has ever laid an egg. So you can disregard all I've said. You can say, oh, this guy is just crazy. He's nutty. Fine. Go find me a bunny that has laid an egg. And when you find it, record it and put it on a video on YouTube. That'll be awesome. But you're not going to find it. You're not going to find it. The sad part about this is, is that the church is worshiping God as the heathens. And then those that speak out the truth on this, because I'm not the only one speaking on this. There's so many brothers on YouTube speaking on this and sisters. We're the bad ones. But all I'm asking you today is to open up your scriptures. I'm nothing more than your brother presenting you the truth of Jesus Christ. So don't get upset. The reason I get so passionate about this topic is because of the fact is that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is overshadowed by a bunny. And these are well-intended believers in Jesus Christ. When I was a believer in Jesus Christ and I had the little Easter buggy, bunny thing, I didn't think anything was wrong. Think of how crazy that is. A Puerto Rican laying eggs around his house so that his family can look for eggs. That is the most ridiculous thing ever. And now that I look back many years back, I just laugh. It's ridiculous. What does that have to do with Jesus Christ? It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Nothing. But I want to talk to you about why I'm so passionate on defending Christ. I don't have to defend him, but I'm very, very passionate on making sure that you don't call him an angel, that you don't call him an archangel, that you don't call him any of that stuff, that you don't uh, compromise him with an Easter bunny egg, that you don't do any of these things because... The word of God tells us that we can come boldly before the throne of God, but the church has twisted that and they're coming arrogantly before the throne of God. Let's take a trip into the days of Exodus. Open up your scriptures and compare everything to the Bible. In Exodus 25, 8 through 9, there was an instruction given by God. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I shew thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. 
there were specific instructions on this tabernacle and I've made a video on the tabernacle on my channel you can search for it it goes in depth of all of the things in the tabernacle I can ensure you that is the most beautiful picture of how man can approach a holy God it was a dwelling place of the presence of God the tabernacle meant to some a tent, to others the place of dwelling of God's presence, and to others the sanctuary. It was beautiful. And one thing I can guarantee you, there were no Easter bunny eggs running around it. It was amazing. It was a sacred place where God chose to meet his people. There was a purpose for this tabernacle. The main purpose for it and what you're witnessing on the screen is an animation that I found on YouTube. And I'll put on there the name of the channel so you can check out other animations that this person has done. They may not be perfect, but I can ensure you the person tried. So before we critique, oh, it doesn't look... He tried. It looks amazing to me. The purpose of the tabernacle... The main purpose is to show you that you are sinful and that God is not. It had, uh, it was 150 feet by 75 feet. It was beautiful. It was covered by like these rug type of coverings and it separated the presence of God from holy and, and his holiness from a wicked, sinful man. You were outside the presence of God. And you couldn't just enter this tabernacle any which way. There was a prescribed way to enter into this tabernacle. Are you understanding me today? We're going, you're going deep into his presence today. We're going back to the basics today. Back to the basics. The whole compound of the tabernacle was surrounded by a high fence. The compound only had one entrance, and this one entrance signified the way that man could enter the tabernacle and go into the presence of God. You couldn't just go into the presence of God any which way. You had one way. Now, when a person entered the tabernacle... This gate was positioned in a specific location. It was always located to the east so that when the people came in, they were facing west when they entered the tabernacle. A direct opposition to the pagan sun worshippers of the day who always faced the east. God took sun worship, God took goddess worship very seriously because of the men and women of that time. And as you can see, the men and women of our time, the many Masonic pastors that are leading churches. In Ezekiel 8, 13 through 16, just so that you can see that I'm showing you, I've showed you scriptures of goddess worship. And now I'm going to show you scriptures of sun worship. He, all, he said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt she greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north, and behold, there sat women, women weeping for Tammuz. Do you know who Tammuz is? That is Semiramis' son. That is Nimrod's son, essentially. He had already arisen to the, to the sun, and she claimed that she was a virgin birth. She claimed that one of his sun rays impregnated her, and boom, out came Tammuz. She claimed to be the promise of Genesis 3.15. May the Lord rebuke sun worship. May the Lord rebuke goddess worship. All of this is satanic. Do not understand that. Then he said unto me, Has thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abomination than these. And he brought me into the inner courts of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east. And they worshipped the sun 
towards the east. This is satanic. This is occult. And God's word forbids it. Yet for some reason it's okay for churches to now have obulus designed in their churches. When if they go back in history, they will see that that's bowels, male reproductive organ. And for some reason it's okay for churches to have Easter egg hunts when if they go back in history, they see that these traditions were for Ishtar, Asarte, the Queen of Heaven, Semiramis, the wife of Baal. Now returning back to the tabernacle, we have already discussed the gate, and we discussed that the gate was positioned in a place so that people were facing west when they entered the tabernacle, uh, a direct opposition to the pain so so sun worshippers of that time. But once you entered the gate, there was a special area called the brazen altar. And in the brazen altar, it was a place where you would present an animal offering. This wasn't just any animal. This was a perfect animal without blemish, a healthy animal without blemish. You have to realize today that the tabernacle is a picture of how you can approach God. You can't just come anyway. You can't just come with the Easter bunny basket. You have to come through the gate, which is Jesus Christ. John 10, 9 says, I am the door. Jesus is the gate. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and fight pasture. Jesus is the gate of the tabernacle, the brazen altar, which we just discussed. It showed the Israelites that before that they can continue to the holies of holies, that they had to approach God with a sacrifice because it showed them that the wages of their sin is death and that death required blood. Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood there is no remission. It showed man that they were in trouble. And that they couldn't just go to God without there being a sacrifice. I want you to understand today the tabernacle and its purpose and how you can approach God. When you realize all of this, this is God painting a picture for humanity. Humanity has a problem of sin and Christ has made himself the gate, has made himself the sacrifice so that you cannot dwell with him and he can dwell with his people. In 1 Peter 1.19 But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Ma Mark 14.24 And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. Hebrews 10.18 Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. You can know how to say his name in Hebrew. You can say Yahweh, Jeshua. Some will say Jehoshua. Some will say Jehoshua. But you know what? That cannot save you. Okay? You can know his name in different languages. It will not save you. You can know the Torah. You can know the New Testament from head to toe. That will not save you. You can follow the Sabbath every single day of the year. That cannot save you. At the brazen altar, what was required as a sacrifice was a lamb without blemish. Notice that there weren't alternatives to enter the holies of holies. It wasn't pronounce his name in this language and then you can go in. No, it required a sacrifice. That was the requirement and that has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. 
Am I saying that you shouldn't learn Hebrew, that you shouldn't learn Greek, that you shouldn't learn different? I'm not saying any of that. But what I'm saying to you today is, is that the work of Jesus Christ has been reduced. And the church, instead of coming boldly before the throne of God, we're coming to him arrogantly before the throne of God. And we have forgotten who Jesus is. And we have forgotten that Jesus is God. In John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is that word. In John 1.14, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. In 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifested among us. Are you getting the picture of the tabernacle here today? Are you getting why we should not associate that gift of salvation with elements of Ishtar Asarte, the queen of heaven. Are you understanding my, my heart cry to you today? In Zechariah 2, 12, 10, we see, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. This is Yahweh speaking prophetically. And he says that he is going to be the one that they shall pierce. Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. In Acts 20, 28, it tells us that God purchased us with his blood. In Revelation 22, 12 through 15, it tells us that Jesus is the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last titles that belong to God. In 2 Samuel 12, 29, we see that Yahweh is the light. And in John 8, 12, we see that Jesus is the light. In Isaiah 48, 17, Yahweh is the Redeemer. In Ephesians 1, 7, Jesus is the Redeemer. In Psalm 23, 1, Yahweh is the Shepherd. In 1 Peter 2, 25, Jesus is that Good Shepherd. In Job 9, 8, Yahweh walks on water, and in Matthew 14, 25, we see that Yahweh manifested in the flesh. Jesus Christ also walks on water. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. And we have reduced that beautiful gift, that beautiful, precious, awesome gift that he took our place, that he resurrected and conquered death to an Easter bunny. In John 1, 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And we see that when Jesus was on this earth, the full head of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost dwelt in Jesus. And we see in Revelation 22, 3, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. There is one throne in heaven, and the Lamb is in that throne. If this doesn't make you excited, if this doesn't make you happy, then I don't know. I don't know. But there's nothing more beautiful that God was manifested in the flesh and dwelt among us. He became the gate. He became the sacrifice for you. If you have backslidden away from God, if you and your heart have turned back to Egypt, the time to come home is now. If you have rejected that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh and you have bought into theologies that tell you that Jesus Christ is an angel, that he is Michael the Archangel, renounce that and come back to Jesus. He loves you. I love you. Let's all turn back to Jesus. In his precious name, amen.